Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. Today we're going to be talking about our first lecture on ecology, which concerns the levels of life. Uh, you can see several learning objectives below explaining and talking about um, the Earth's matter and its sources of energy and what the levels of life are and what is their proper order and being able to tell if two creatures are the same species or not. So let's start. All right, for this first part, I'm going to offer you guys a very weird analogy. I want you to think of the Earth like a ship in the bottle. And the ship in the bottle is over here on the left-hand side to help visualize what we mean by this. So I want you to think of this analogy of the Earth like a ship in the bottle when we're talking about things like mass and energy. Now, mass is simply the amount of stuff that makes up an object. It's not the amount of space, just the amount of stuff, the amount of material that makes up an object. And obviously, the Earth is more massive than the ship in the bottle, but for the purpose of our questioning, they work the same basic way. So let's talk about mass a little bit more. So can the ship or the Earth gain more mass from the outside? Now keep in mind, the answer is going to be the same for both of them because of the way I've structured this analogy. And the idea is this. If you take a look at the ship over here on the left-hand side and you ask yourself, can this ship gain any more mass to itself? Can it gain any more mass at all? No, it's enclosed. It's basically shut off from the outside world in terms of the amount of stuff that gets inside. And the tr same is true for the Earth. Um, the total amount of mass on Earth is essentially constant. There are exceptions, things like meteorites, or if you want to go in reverse, we of course send up lots of little satellites into outer space. But for the most part, the Earth's mass is a pretty constant number. And so we would consider this, in terms of the Earth and the ship in the bottle, to be a closed system. That is to say, nothing really enters and nothing really leaves. There is, of course, little exceptions here and there. But compared to the total mass of the Earth, which is right up here, the Earth's mass is essentially the same as it's been for billions of years. Now, let's think of this same analogy when we're thinking of energy. Now, let's start with the ship again, because it's easier to think of that way. Does the ship get any energy from the outside world outside of the bottle and if you look well you can actually see right here there's light coming through the bottle coming through the glass to the ship hence you can see the ship and the same is actually true of earth there's always light coming into the earth from the sun and again you can see the bright spot right here so in terms of energy yeah there's always some kind of sunlight coming in um, keep in mind, the Earth kind of breaks this analogy because it does have its own internal core. It's, you know, it's hot, molten core. But for the most part, most life doesn't, don't have access to the uh, core as a source of energy, so most life is dependent upon the sun, not the geothermal thermal vents that exist. So the sun is what powers photosynthesis, of course. We talked about that last unit, and we'll talk a little bit later about the greenhouse effect and why that's important. So in terms of energy, the ship and Earth are an open system. That is to say, light is always coming in, there's en always energy coming in, and our best guess, our best estimates, is about 1,350 watts per square meter, and that's at the top of the Earth's atmosphere before a lot of the gases filter out the sunlight. So it's actually quite a bit of energy per square meter. All right. Two terms we got to make sure we're clear on before we continue. The first is biotic. That's referring to anything that is living or was was or was living. So that also includes so includes uh, dead organisms. So th things like wood is considered biotic. Organisms, uh, fossils, of course, and another thing that's would be um, fair game, oil, coal. All these are biotic substances because at one point they were part of a living thing. A lot of times we'll say these are organic. Usually that means the same thing. Uh, if you get to chemistry though, sometimes it doesn't. The opposite of this is abiotic. That's referring to anything that is not alive and has never been alive and never will be alive. Rocks, water, ooh, water, and um, 
air. Air is a, another good example. A lot of times we'll uh, um, say such things like uh, abiotic and inorganic is the uh, common, more scientific word we use. So here we have a quick little brief picture of the different levels of life, and I'll show you another picture that we're going to run through. And traditionally, we start small and work our way up. So I'm going to be going this way to follow this path, and we'll talk about what each stage actually uh, means. You should have learned a lot of this stuff from your seventh grade science teacher, so some of this stuff should be review. And uh, we're on about page, I want to say, 99 in your textbook, if you want to follow along with your textbook. All right. So this is that same type of picture. This is actually out of a college level textbook, but it's showing the same basic things. Again, we start small at the atomic structure or the molecular structure and work our way up to bigger and bigger scales. And all of this is included in biology. So we're going to start here at the molecular and chemical structure and then work our way up to the bigger stuff. So we start small. So first up, the atom. Now, we went over atomic structure and um, chemical bonds in Unit 1, but just to be clear, let's reinforce this. An atom is the smallest unit of an element that still behaves like that element. So if you're talking about an atom of iron, it still conducts heat like iron. It still is magnetic like iron. But these properties, the magnet magnetism, the conduction of heat, these properties are lost or changed if the atom is broken down even further. So if you break down an atom of iron into its component parts, its protons, its neutrons, and electrons, those properties will essentially be lost. Whereas a compound, which is slightly larger, is a group of atoms bonded together. And this can also include things like molecules. Um, examples, of course, include CO2, glucose. That last picture I showed showed ATP and, of course, DNA. And then next up we have compounds and molecules being part of the way that organelles function. Now, of course, we talked about organelles in the very last unit. These are a specialized subunit in a cell that actually help the cell stay alive. Things like the mitochondria, the nucleus, the Golgi apparatus, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the endoplasmic reticulum, or the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, uh, oftentimes referred to as the organs of the cells. And you'll note for each of these things, all of these are actually not considered alive. They're all technically abiotic. All of them. But as we get further and further up, we'll switch to talking about more biotic things. So next up, we hit cells and tissues. So the cell is the first point at which we consider life beginning. So I'm just going to put life starts here. And remember when we talked about in the very beginning of class, the beginning of the year, we talked about life having all these different properties, has to have DNA, has to be able to reproduce, has to <clears throat> be able to grow, evolve, uh, all that stuff. Cell is the first level we talk about in biology that actually fits all that. So that's why we say life starts here. Anything smaller than a cell can't do all the traits of life, can't possess all the traits of life. Um, therefore, it's not considered alive. So cell can do all the stuff, grow, reproduce, respond to stimuli, and of course there's lots of different cells, your skin cells, your liver cells, hair cells, heart cells, lots and lots of different cells. And when you put a bunch of cells together, that's where you get a tissue. Now, of course, tissue is technically alive, though it's not independent, but different types of tissues are essentially groups of cells that perform the same general function. So there's muscle tissues, nervous tissues, connective tissues, bone marrow is considered a tissue. So all these different tissues are just groups of cells that perform the same general function. So different tissues, we'll talk about how they go in, go in to make up organs and organ systems, and then we'll eventually get to the organism. So organs and organ systems, these are groups of tissues, so different groups of tissues, that perform a very specific function. So you have heart tissues, which work to circulate blood throughout your body. Lung tissues, which work to take in oxygen to the, and, uh, and spread it to the different cells of your body and then get rid of the toxic carbon dioxide. The bones of your body are technically an organ system that actually help perform structural support for your body. So your muscles and connective tissues have something to walk on. Um, 
stomach, of course, a storage area for food before it gets digested by the uh, large and small intestines. And your skin is technically an organ as well. It's actually your largest organ because it covers your entire body, works as a barrier from the outside world and helps keep your body hydrated. So there's, of course, lots more organs. If you take anatomy, you'll learn all about that. Whereas an organism is an individual life form. That should be a very, very obvious definition. Now, I'm going to take a quick detour because before we go up any higher, there's one other term I want to add into our list that wasn't in the pictures. And that's the term species. A species is a group of organisms that can mate and produce fertile offspring. And I have this all in capital letters for a very specific reason. Uh, as I said, this level is not shown in the other pictures, but I want to make sure we're clear on this because we will hit on this concept of species again in a later unit. So let's talk about species a little bit more in depth real quick before we continue on. In this uh, slide, I have a horse on the left over here and then a donkey on the right. And the basic question you could ask somebody is, are they the same species? And anybody who's not really well educated in biology would say, well, they look alike, so yeah, they're the same species. But that's not what the definition of species tells us. The definition of species tells us they have to be able to fit three traits. They have to be able to mate, assuming you have opposite genders, of course, and you're in a species that has genders. They have to be able to mate. They have to be able to produce an offspring, and that offspring has to be fertile. Well, can a horse and donkey mate? Yeah, they actually can. They can produce an offspring. The problem is they're still not the same species because the offspring they do produce are sterile, meaning the offspring, this guy over here and this guy over here, can't produce offspring of their own. So there's no way to continue the line. There's no way to pass on the genes. So because they're both sterile, we categorize horses and donkeys as not the same species. So you have to have all three things. You have to be able to, one, mate, so the anatomy has to work together. Two, you have to be able to have an offspring. And again, that's in sexually reproducing creatures. And three, the offspring must be fertile. That is to say, the offspring must be able to pass on the genes. Be fertile. If it can't do those three things, it's not the same species. So many people will confuse two things and think they're the same species when really they're not because they don't fit all three of these qualifications. You have to have all three. Let's try this again. Tiger and a lion, are they the same species? Well, they're both cats, that's true. They both eat meat, that's true. Can you find them on the same continent? Yeah, actually you can. There's a type of lion that lives in India. But when you actually look, once again, at the specifics of the definition of species, well, can they mate? Yeah, we know that from tigers and lions that have been in captivity. Can they produce an offspring? Yeah, we know that too. Uh, again, from captive lions and tigers, we know they can actually produce offspring. But both offspring are essentially sterile. So once again, you're not talking about the same species. Um, side note, the way they name these things is usually based upon the uh, father first and then the mother. So the tigon is a tiger father and then uh, a lion mother. And then the liger is a lion father and a tiger mother. And uh, the ligers are giants, whereas the tigons are dwarfs by comparison to their parents. In either case, though, um, they are essentially sterile. They cannot have offspring of their own. Uh, therefore, tigers and lions are not the same species because their offspring of the two, the hybrids, cannot pass on the genes. Uh, there has been one reported case that I'll talk about in a later unit of a liger, I believe it is, having an offspring. But again, that only happens in captivity. It does not happen in nature. So what we see by the definition of species is you really don't have to look at too much to tell if a uh, set of organisms are the same species. You really just have to know the basic facts of their reproduction, even without seeing the organism. So I have a setup here where you can't tell what insects I'm talking about. But if you have insect A and it's able to mate with insect B and it produces an offspring, insect C, that's sterile. Well, are they the same species? No, 
They're not. The insect that they produce, their offspring, is sterile, can't perpetuate the genes, can't pass on its genes, so it can't perpetuate the line, can't continue the line. Insect D and insect E, are they the same species? Well, they can mate, and they can produce an offspring, and that offspring appears to be fertile. It can have offspring of its own. So insect D and E probably are the same species. Um, again, you you're not doing this based upon how they look or where they live or what they eat. None of that stuff matters in the definition of species. It's can they mate, can they produce an offspring, and is that offspring capable of having its own children later on to pass on the genes. So I'm hoping you guys get the idea of the definition of species yet. So don't tell me two things are the same species because they look alike or they behave the same way or they sound alike. None of that stuff matters in the definition of species. So with that said, Let's get back to our list where we were before. All right, we did organism and we did species, so now we're gonna go on to populations and then communities. So a population, there it is. A population is a collection of a single species located in one area. So key words here, a single species, one area. An example of this, would be black bears. Now there are black bears all over the US, but for a population, we're not talking about all the black bears in the US, we're talking about a specific area. So I said the black bear population in the Sandia Mountains. One species, one area. That's a population. Now going one level higher than that, a community is all the different species. So now we have many species, all the species, Again, still in one area. Again, these must be living things. We're not, we're not including abiotic things just yet. So an example would be all the trees, birds, bears, ants, grass, and all the other living things in the Sandia Mountains. So basically all the biotic factors within a specific area. That is a community. And people often confuse the term community with ecosystem, which is one level up. And we'll talk about the differences in the next slide. So an ecosystem, again, people like to throw this term around a lot, is all the species, just like a community, so all the biotic things in one area, plus, we're adding more on here, all the non-living things, all the abiotic things in one area. So a lot of times people will talk about an ecosystem when they mean a community, and um, they'll not understand the differences. So an example of an ecosystem, if we're going to stick with the Sandia Mountain Range as our specific area, is all the living things, all the species, the birds, the bees, the grass, all that stuff in the Sandia Mountains, plus all the abiotic stuff, the streams, the river, the, the abiotic parts of the soil, um, the actual rocks, the mountains themselves, that's all part of the ecosystem. So some people get confused and confuse the use of the terms community and ecosystem. Try not to let it fool you. Community is only biotic things and ecosystem is all abiotic and biotic things in one area. And finally, we get to biomes. Now biomes are different ecosystems around the world and I didn't put the word different here, but you could probably just add it onto your definition. Different ecosystems around the world that share similar types of climates. Now what do we mean by climates? We mean the same type of average rainfall, that's precipitation, and temperature cycles. Um, oftentimes we'll have similar types of vegetation and the organisms in these different ecosystems, if they're very similar ecosystems, will have uh, animals that actually operate in very similar ways in terms of their niche. So for example, deserts. You can find deserts in almost every continent, with the exception of the North and the South Pole areas, the polar regions, and they're all very, very hot and very, very dry. And same thing with rainforest. You can find rainforest in at least three continents that I can think of, Africa, South America, Central America as well, and Southeast Asia. And so these are all similar types of ecosystems found around the world, very far apart from each other, that have similar amounts of precipitation and temperature cycles. Uh, there should be a good picture on page 100 of your book. And then all these ecosystems together is what makes up the biosphere, the actual whole of the uh, surface of the Earth, the part of the Earth that contains living things. Now this picture, it's not in your book, but there's a very similar picture 
uh, at the top of page 99. This picture I like because it shows the basic connection between different uh, biomes. So for instance, if we were talking about a biome that was very, very, very dry, here's annual precipitation, that's rainfall there. So we have something that's very dry but very cold, here's temperature, we would be talking about right here the tundra. The tundra would be like um, in Siberia, in Russia, or way, 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 way to the north of Can in, in Canada, just south of Alaska. Tundra, very, very dry, but very, very cold. Whereas if you're very, very dry, but you're very, very hot, you're in subtropical deserts. This would be like the Sahara, or the Mojave, or the, um, what's the one in Asia? There's a Mongolian desert in Asia, I forget what the name of the desert is, but there's several deserts that are really, really dry, really, really hot, and that's the system that defines them. Whereas if you're really, really hot, but you also have lots and lots of rain, well then you're way up here. You're in a rainforest, and as I said before, rainforests can occur all over the world. You have the Brazilian rainforest in South America. There's rainforests in Central America, on uh, Southeast Asia as well, and all the other um, uh, biomes that we're talking about all fit within these categories, within these extremes, somewhere in here. Uh, New Mexico tends to be unique because we tend to be right, oops, right in an area kind of that's just part one uh, biome and part another depending on where in the state you go so that's why a lot of scientists actually like to study and work in New Mexico for studying biomes because you can get a whole of four different biomes in one state and that's kind of a rare thing okay guys so that covers the basics of the levels of life make sure you ask questions in class if you have them and I'll see you in the next video